My name is Dr. Becca Pachotto, and I am an archaeologist. I'm curious about what life was like in the past and what that can tell us about how we got where we are today and how we might face our future. I study the artifacts and bones people of the past left behind, and I get to explore the places they inhabited. In 2013, I responded to an ad I saw on Facebook. It was a different time then. And I joined a team of researchers working in South Africa. There, deep underground in the Rising Star cave system, we discovered the bones of an ancient human relative we call Homo naledi. This is an artist's reconstruction of what we think Homo naledi may have looked like in life. Homo naledi's bones are 250, 300,000 years old, and they're helping us get to know a long-lost relative who had a small but seemingly complex brain, hands that were capable of tool use, legs and feet that were well adapted to walking upright, just like we do. And we hypothesize that Homo naledi was engaging in a behavior, the deliberate disposal of the dead that a lot of people thought was the sole domain of modern humans. And if you want to know more about the science of Homo naledi, you can watch on YouTube talks that my colleagues have given from TEDx stages all over the world. They're really interesting, they're really good. But let's face it, paleoanthropology, this study of our ancient human origins, it's not something that everyone is interested in. And that's okay. There's all kinds of amazing things to be interested in the world. You can't possibly follow all of them, right? I mean, for example, I'm not really into dinosaurs or particle physics, but I know cool people whose work I respect who are. And I didn't even used to be all that interested in paleoanthropology myself. So how did I end up here? Face down on a ladder, 30 meters underground, on the wrong side of an 18-centimeter gap in the rock, excavating bones that have caused textbooks about who we are and where we come from to be rewritten. How did this become part of my commute to work? <laughs> this is my colleague, Matabella. He's moving through part of the rising star cave we call Superman Crawl. For some perspective, it would be like crawling underneath about six rows of chairs in this theater. And in order to get to where the fossils are in Rising Star Cave, we must pass through Superman Crawl. And that's one of the easy parts. On days like this, I wonder myself, how did I get here? What am I doing? What was I thinking? And I can tell you, at the moment that that picture was taken, I was, I was thinking four things. Number one, ow. Number two, how can I get just a little further into this crack? Number three, this is so cool. And number four, oh gosh, don't mess up the science, don't mess up the science. My path to that moment, to being able to fold time, that's what archaeologists do. We use all of the technology and the knowledge of the present to reach back, to touch the past so we can learn about it and learn from it. My path to that moment has not been a straight line. I didn't even know you could be an archaeologist until I was in my 30s. But it started probably around this time. See, I've always been curious about the world around me, and I've loved exploring. Where does this trail go? What's underneath that rock? When I was five, I wanted to be a Muppet. Kermit and the gang had great adventures, and I wanted to join them. They were all quirky, but they got along, and when they worked together, they accomplished great things. To be fair, I still kind of want to be a Muppet. By the time I got to middle school and high school, I'd set my sights for exploration just a little further afield. My heroes were Sally Ride and Krista McAuliffe and absolutely everyone who got to go on the space shuttle. They were risk takers, they were explorers, they were scientists, and I wanted to be like them. I was going to study all the right things, I was going to become an astronaut, I was going to space. I knew my trajectory. I was also interested in other things along this time. I liked history, I liked going to the museums, I liked learning about other cultures and languages. I just figured that's what I would do for fun and not for my job. But I stayed on that trajectory and partway through college, life intervened in some pretty challenging and unexpected ways. And gradually, my trajectory shifted. 
I mean, for one thing, I took organic chemistry, and I realized that that was not for me. I took some anthropology classes and some language classes, and I thought those were pretty cool. One of my jobs during college was at a living history museum. A couple days a week, I would go to work and I would dress up like it was 1819, you know, Jane Austen's time. And I would talk to museum visitors about what life was like at the time that Alabama was writing its state constitution. While I was there, I discovered I liked helping people learn new things. Eventually, driven by that ever-present curiosity and urge to take risks and explore, I started working in outdoor and wilderness education. I was teaching people to rock climb, how to read maps, how to pick out the space station and the satellites from the stars in the sky. We were talking about natural history and human history. I got to work with incredible people and go to amazing places. And I learned about the education philosophy of Kurt Hahn. He was the founder of the Outward Bound Schools, which is where I was working. And in the mid-20th century, Kurt Hahn wrote that he regarded it as the foremost task of education to ensure the survival of these qualities. An enterprising curiosity, an indefatigable spirit, tenacity in pursuit, a readiness for sensible self-denial, and above all, compassion. And these five qualities seem like they're pretty important, whether you're going to be a Muppet, an astronaut, an archaeologist, or a human being on planet Earth. While I was at Outward Bound, I had the opportunity to meet my first ever real live archaeologist. His name was Greg, and he was my co-instructor on a canoeing course. And this guy kept making us pull over to the side of the creek where we were paddling to look at pottery that was eroding out of the banks. And all of a sudden, we weren't just talking about human history with our students. We were looking at it right there where somebody had left it hundreds and hundreds of years ago. Not in a museum. How cool is that? So fast forward a few years, I told you this was not a straight line. I'm in graduate school for anthropology, and I take an archaeology class. And I am hooked. We're talking light bulbs, just like in a cartoon. There was a career nobody had told me about this, where I could do science and history and exploration and have adventures outdoors and learn things that nobody alive today knew already and help other people learn about it too. Whoa. I met people who were curious about the same things I was curious about. Sure, a lot of us were quirky, a little bit like the Muppets, but when we worked together, we could accomplish amazing things. We could fold time. We could reach back into the past and do research about communities of enslaved Africans and African Americans who in the 17 and 1800s formed communities for themselves hidden deep in the Great Dismal Swamp where they could be free. There's an artist reconstruction there of what we think one of the communities look like. It's based on our excavations. And it's just about what it sounds like in the Great Dismal Swamp. It's really big. It's swampy. Everything there wants to bite you, scratch you, make you itch, or eat you. And it is awesome. <laughs> it's also a powerful place with a powerful history that has so much to tell us today about resistance and resilience and community 300 years ago and in the present. In 2013, there was a lull in our work in the swamp. We were taking a break from the field, and this posting appeared in a corner of Facebook called Bioanthropology News. And this job ad was looking for archaeologists or paleoanthropologists with some caving and climbing experience who could fit into and work in small places and who were willing to go to South Africa right away. My friend Rebecca saw the ad and she sent it to me with an email saying, this sort of sounds like you. And I agreed, but even though I knew I had the excavation skills and the adventure skills they were looking for, I was pretty sure it was a long shot. My specialty in archaeology was the things that happened in the last 500 years, not things that happened hundreds of thousands or millions of years ago. But I took the risk to apply. What's the worst that could happen? They completely ignore my application? Meh, right? Paleoanthropology in 2013 really wasn't my jam, but excavating in remote and challenging places was, so it seemed like a reasonable risk to take. Six of us were selected, all of us happened to be women, and over the course of a month-long expedition, we recovered more bones of ancient human relatives than had been discovered in all of South Africa in the previous 80 years.
And because the grainy black and white CCTV camera images from underground reminded people on the surface of those old pictures from early space flights, we were dubbed underground astronauts. And if you think about that too hard, it's kind of silly, but as somebody who used to want to be an astronaut and still kind of does, it's also pretty cool. We've been working in Rising Star Cave for going on six years now. These are my colleagues and me recently pulling some very heavy, very fragile fossils out of the cave. That journey from 30 meters underground to the surface, it's a distance of about two football fields, took us almost two hours that day. When we're empty-handed, we can do it in about 20 minutes. We know where to find fossils, but we keep exploring. Every new bone and every new passage in the cave we discover lets us be curious in new ways. It lets us ask questions we didn't even know we should be asking, like, how, how has this cave changed in the last 300,000 years? Did Homo sapiens and Homo naledi ever meet? When, when we talk to kids, we often ask them, what do you want to be when you grow up? And I think about what Kurt Hahn said about tenacity and curiosity and spirit and compassion. And those are characteristics that drive exploration. They drive discovery in the field and in the lab. And I think that a more important question for us to be asking kids is, what are you curious about? Many of us will grow up to be Muppets or astronauts or archaeologists or whatever it is we dream about when we're young. But a lot of us are going to take winding paths. Our trajectories are going to change along the way. We might change careers, sometimes more than once, and that's OK. We never know how all of those skills and those bits of knowledge and that broader worldview that we're accumulating along that winding path, we never know how all of those things are going to knit together, how they're going to help us connect to colleagues in other fields, what kind of opportunities they'll open up for us, how they'll make discoveries that are going to change the world, discoveries that'll help us learn more about our past, about our planet, about our universe, how they might help us create solutions to the many, many challenges we're encountering. I think we should be encouraging our young people to be curious, to explore their interests, and to take risks. We older humans, we should be doing that too. There are so many things to discover. And fostering curiosity, spirit, tenacity, and compassion, that's something that everyone here can do to contribute to those discoveries. My path to archaeology has been about as convoluted as the route we take from the surface to where the fossils are in the Rising Star Cave. I've followed my enterprising curiosity, as Kurt Hahn would say, to the swamps of Virginia and to the caves of South Africa. And it's been an incredible journey. And we've made really interesting discoveries along the way, and there's more to come. I hope that the things that I have done have had a positive impact on the world. But that curiosity, that's the thing that we should be fostering in ourselves and in our young people. And I would just ask you, what are you curious about? Thank you. <laughs>